Welcome all to the third in our summer listening series, um, Anti-Blackness in the Asian American and Pacific Islander Communities, and Eid Mubarak. Um, this series of conversations interrogating Asian American and Pacific Islander history of anti-Blackness is hosted in partnership with the UC Irvine Humanity Center, South Asian Network, US, US Census, the Orange County uh, Meetany, uh, the Orange County um, Asian Pacific Islander Community Alliance. Um, yeah, um, on behalf of the planning committee, I'm Annie Nguyen, and I have the pleasure of serving as your moderator today. In our previous sessions, we addressed our community directly, asking why do Black lives matter to us? We also discussed the impact of anti-Blackness on education and how affirmative action plays a role in remedying educational disparities. Today's topic will be colorism and everyday racism. How does anti-Blackness present itself in our daily lives? So in our session today, we asked our speakers to examine their own intimate experiences with colorism in their everyday life. One definition of colorism describes the phenomenon as prejudice or discrimination against individuals with a dark skin tone, typically among people of the same ethnic or racial group. Colorism is a subtle way Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders perpetuate anti-Blackness every day. By favoring light skin, we can see the preference and thus the harm done to darker skinned, especially our multiracial individuals in our, our communities. These practices have a long history and is only one way in which our communities have participated in further marginalizing Black community members. Today, our speakers will address our beloved AAPI community members about their own experiences grappling with colorism and the effects that has on ourselves and all those around us. I'm really excited to welcome our guests today. So first we have Melania Singh, the Healthcare and Transgender Services Coordinator for the LGBT Center of Orange County. We also have joining us Nikki Uy, a fellow at Ocapica and a graduate student at UCI. Um, we're also introducing Tammy Kim, the Managing Director of the Korean American Center, and Julie Bo with co-presenter Kiana Kinsey at the table. Julie is a community activist with the California Healthy Nail Salon Collaborative, and Kiana is a student at Smith College in Massachusetts. We'll also leave time at the end of the conversation for any questions, so please post in the chat or on Facebook if you have any comments or questions. Um, each of our community leaders have prepared a letter to our community and will be speaking to all of you about their own experience, experiences and history with witnessing colorism in their spaces. First, we'll have Melania speak. The floor is yours. Thank you so much for the amazing introduction and uh, thank you so much for having me on here. Um, as you mentioned, Eden Barks, everyone who is observing, and I am honored to be on this panel with you all. Um, I myself am a Afro-Indo-Caribbean um, person and I am deeper complexed of darker skin and so Colorism plays a very big part in how I navigate um, the world and spaces, especially within South Asian spaces. Um, oftentimes, I'm seen as other or treated as other because um, I am of a multi-cultural background. I'm not 100% Indian, I'm mixed. And so that can look um, several ways. Sometimes it kind of brought me through language, um, excluding me from conversations or using um, certain language in order to make me feel as if I'm not a part of the community, as if I'm an outsider and they're trying to explain things to me as if I don't know um, things because they don't see me as a part of the community. Also, we look at the beauty industry, um, for instance, Bollywood being one of the biggest uh, media outlets in the, I would say in the world, it's, uh, I would probably say it grosses more than Hollywood itself. And what that looks like, um, most of the women in, Hollywood, in Bollywood are the fair skin, are 
to women with more Eurocentric features. Um, and oftentimes they put down darker skinned people. There is a product called Fair and Lovely, which is now switched over to the name Glow and Lovely because folks have been pushing back and saying, we can't continue to perpetuate this um, anti-blackness, this um, anti-dark skin colorism. And so um, they, for the longest, have been leading forces by a brand named Unilead, and they've been the leading force for um, skin lightening treatments. And so uh, the skin lightening can, world and, and business is a billion dollar business. Um, I think uh, Asia as a whole, but India is kind of leading that. And we're finally starting to push back and say, it's not okay to continue to perpetuate fair as the standard of beauty and putting down other people and only showcasing fair skin. Um, and most of the models who uh, model for fair and lovely are already fair skin people. And so it continues to create this mentality that I need to be this way if I want to be successful. The ads show uh, women with deeper skin complexions looking sad, being depressed, unsuccessful. And the lighter they get, the happier they become, the more successful they become. And this is embedded in people from an early age. I mean, this goes generations back and we need to break that mentality and, and overthrow the patriarchy. Um, because a lot of that is deeply rooted in, in white supremacy and in ideals that were brought over um, with you know, the British and the Portuguese and um, the Europeans when they invaded Asia, um, South Asia and India to be exact. So I do my part by speaking up and speaking out um, against colorism and anti-blackness as someone who is a uh, black Asian. And um, yeah, things are quite but yeah, thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much for your words, Melania. It's so important to hear from you uh, today. Um, next, we have Nikki Oli, who will be talking about uh, her experiences with colorism as well. Nikki? Hi. <clears throat> Sorry, hello. Um, I wrote a letter because I get really nervous public speaking. So if I'm not looking at the camera, that's why. Um, so I'm just gonna get started. <clears throat> Dear community, hello. I wanna first thank the organizers of this Summer of Listening series for making space for conversations about doing our part to support black liberation. It's never easy to be critical, especially of ourselves, but it is 100% necessary that we reflect, dream, and hold ourselves accountable to build a better world for our black community members and therefore all of us. Because of that, thanks so much to everyone sharing their experiences and knowledge on this panel to help guide us through these conversations. And thank you to everyone tuned in for making time to learn. This will be a personal letter simply because racism is a personal issue. I will touch on institutional barriers maintained by colorism, but I hope that by focusing on my own story, it will help you understand how deeply damaging colorism is and how changing our mindsets about skin color is an important step in creating a world that is kinder for all of us, particularly with black communities. First, let me tell you about me. My name is Nikki Ui, and I am a Thai, Chinese, Indonesian, American sister, daughter, and learner. I'm a woman, and I am fat. I grew up in West Covina, California, specifically in a predominantly Latinx and Filipinx part of the area. This is important for later. I was born brown, will always be brown, and struggle to find pride in that. So the story starts with trying to be brown and Asian. Here's something I had to learn. You can be brown and Asian at the same time. Revolutionary, I know, but when what we call Asian is in the United States, rooted in only East Asia, and we have this weird morphed idea of what East Asians look like, that is light skinned with straight black hair, and that isn't even true, belonging is a question. While a lot of this bias towards East Asia is rooted in US colonial and economic histories in China, Japan, and Korea, it is also something that we Asians also perpetuate when we say being Asian is defined by crazy rich Asians and Taiwanese boba and subtle Asian traits and 18 million rising, which both all promote a singular vision of the Asian body, despite their political differences. Asia is bigger and often a lot browner than that. 
One thing you can do now is check yourself when you call something Asian. What do you mean by that? Is there some other way to describe it? I say Khmer or Southeast Asian when I mean those groups. Do you? Now, when we talk about colorism in the Asian community, I always hear, oh, it's not racism. It's based on an ancient idea about farming and other similar ideas to that. You know, your rich royals sitting in their shaded palaces while poor folks labor and bake in the sun. And I'm not gonna deny that these histories are true and I'm not even qualified to talk about Asian cultural practices and history. It's not what I study. But what I can say is that the problematic relationship of class and skin color are the roots of that history and they haven't stopped. What I can also say is that we don't live in that Asia anymore. We live in an Asia or a diasporic Asian community that has faced colonialism, imperialism, and global capitalism, particularly by the United States in this 21st century, and therefore has influence of Western ideology, including racism, even without Western presence. Many of us consume Asian, um, sorry, American media and know, even if we don't agree, that American standards of respectability and race have become part of who we are because of America's past physical presence in camp towns, cities, political spheres across Asia in the past. And that's not our fault. We never need to apologize for colonial imperial histories. And I'm really proud of all of us for upholding our cultures and stories beyond the violence our communities have faced. But we do have to recognize that colorism in the West is always rooted in anti-Black racism in slavery and white supremacy. Today in the US and in Asia, colorism isn't just about classism. It's classism combined with the systematic devaluing of black people everywhere, AKA it's classism mixed with racism. In our globalized world, colorism everywhere is a tool of racism, particularly to maintain both anti-blackness and white supremacy because it asks us to aspire for whiteness. You can live anywhere, not just the United States and both experience and promote anti-blackness if you uphold colorism. So what does this mean for me? I realized colorism and anti-blackness are tied together because kids used to call me a nickname that blended Nikki with the N-word. I was assumed to be more ghetto and have knowledge about slang. I am not and will never be a black woman. And yet the stereotypes of blackness were projected onto me. Remember, I'm not from a white community. This is not a black white issue. Because colorism is a tool of racism within the United States, because skin color is not about class, but also about race, my darker skin meant that I was subject to anti-blackness, especially by other light-skinned people of color, especially by other Asians. Now, when I grew up in a community of predominantly people of color, that doesn't mean I grew up in an area with physically brown people. I was always one of the darkest people I knew, especially because West Covina does not have a large black population. While Pilipinx and Latinx people can be dark-skinned, colonial histories and colorism are huge parts of their cultures as well, with papaya soaps and problematic ideas of bettering the race, or my Spanish is terrible, but mejorar la raza, keeping dark skin as a shameful bad thing that needs to be fixed or bred out to fix. Being dark was always a part of my life. But I want to pause here and say that I've never experienced colorism as a Black person because I'm not a Black person. The experience of being of Black folks with anti-Blackness and colorism from non-Black communities is not something I can speak on. Projections of anti-Blackness onto my brown skin are not the same as experiencing being Black. And I want us to think about that when we, especially dark-skinned folk, talk about how difficult life is being brown. It's a really harmful mistake that I used to make a lot when I was beginning anti-racism work, especially as someone who's only lightly brown, as you could say, and I urge you to be better than I was. What does Asian American colorism look like to someone who is Black and Asian, like Miliana was speaking about? How do Black folks experience colorism from Asians? These are questions that this panel might not be able to completely unpack. Anti-Blackness through colorism works by devaluing Black skin and therefore Black folks, even when Black people are not around. Colorism means that I grew up hoping to at least be lighter brown because my area didn't have white folks to aspire to be only light-skinned people of color who taught me that light skin meant beauty and success. I believed I was ugly and could never be beautiful, which was only reinforced when I couldn't find brown Asian idols because the standards of beauty even within my own community are rooted in anti-blackness. I couldn't be pretty when makeup didn't come in my shade and clothes were never meant for my skin or my fat body. I meant stressing when doing speech and interview practice for academic decathlon and later when presenting my undergraduate thesis because I knew I had to try harder at respectability, both in how I dressed and how I acted, as I would be assumed unprofessional because of my skin color, because black folks are not assumed to be capable of professionalism within the United States and the world would always equate my skin color with blackness despite my non-black identity. It worked the other way around too. 
who was told they were beautiful, who was assumed to be smart and capable, I can guarantee you their skin color was not my shade or any darker. And these things sound small, right? Beauty isn't that big of a deal. Respectability is a scam. Workplaces can change. It's really easy for us to say those things. But as a dark-skinned person, it's hard to feel that they're true because they're not. The problem with colorism is that it's so personal, it's so deeply rooted, that it creates a sense of self-worth defined by racism. Colorism destroys potential and allows racism to thrive because it prevents dark-skinned people from feeling like thriving is a possibility for us. I can never be good enough, not because I didn't try, but because I could never change my skin color. I can never be pretty, so I shouldn't date. I would never be physically desirable, so I had to try hard, harder to be loud and funny, so maybe something would be noteworthy about me. I could never be professional, so I shouldn't try hard to get far. I just needed to settle. I can never be a leader, so I needed to learn the best ways to follow. I can never be enough because I had skin that would never be acceptable, and I learned to be okay with that. And that's how we get institutional issues. I talked here about desirability politics and professionalism, which are two things that I think about the most as a dark-skinned single woman working in a white-collar environment. But I haven't even addressed colorism and incarceration, colorism and medical discrimination, colorism and educational attainment, colorism and housing justice. We can't fix wage gaps if we keep teaching that brown skin is unprofessional, keeping black and physically brown folks from striving for leadership. We can't vote for black leaders yet criminalize dark skin. We can't create a community that will be safe for black folks when we maintain certain behaviors and ideologies that tell everyone within our communities and outside of it that dark skin is worthless. We can't keep saying colorism is this old Asian tradition when today it's rooted in anti-blackness because that's ignoring the problem and allowing colorism to survive. So where does that leave us, Asians and Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders, which I haven't you know, I don't want to speak for your communities because I'm not part of it. Addressing colorism is not the end of anti-blackness. Changing our cultures to eliminate colorism is how we get that better world. The next time you, like I often do, stress about getting dark spots, spots <laughs> and question if you're getting too dark, ask yourself what that's saying about people who are dark. The next time you assume poverty from a South or a Southeast Asian, a question why that parallels the way that the U.S. stereotypes Black people, because it's not a coincidence. Racism and colorism don't start or end with any of us, but it's on every single one of us to do what we can in our own lives, to build a culture, a home, a workspace, wherever that looks like, where dark skin does not only belong, but is allowed to have value. And that's how we take steps, baby steps, to build a community free of anti-Blackness. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much for your uh, speech, Nikki. I'm so um, lucky to be able to work and learn from you every day. Um, next, we have Tammy, who will be speaking uh, from a letter as well. Sorry about that. Can you guys hear me now? Yes, thanks, Tammy. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, thank you so much for having me here. Um, whether you're Asian, Black, Hispanic, Latinx, Indigenous, Middle Eastern, or Pacific Islanders, there's a share, th uh, a thread of shared experience um, of oppression that runs through all peoples of color, which has manifested itself in different ways. Um, but as non-Black people of color, Asian Americans have really been complacent um, in this neutral state of being, giving into this notion um, that we're the model minority when it comes to Black lives. And I'm really grateful for this particular conversation and the previous conversations in the past two series, uh, which can provide insights into how and where we as Asian Americans, how we can participate in interracial coalitions for racial justice. So I want to thank you very much. Um, I was going to say, you know, Nikki said it all, so maybe I could just stop here. <laughs> but, um, you know, just to add everything uh, that Nikki said, which in, in everything that she said um, was very correct. So I'm going to just take a, a slightly different direction here. Um, is, uh, you know, while there's been a lot of discussion around the topic of colorism in both the Asian, um, or in both the African American and Latinx communities, this is really one of the first platforms, at least that I'm aware of, um, that is really 
taken a look at this topic within the Asian American community. So colorism has such a deep and profound impact on, on our psyches. Um, and I'll get into that, you know, Nikki um, alluded to that, but I mean, it really does a whirlwind on you um, in many ways. And, you know, as a collective society, I, it, it's been very damaging for us. And I would actually even argue that colorism is the root cause of inner pan-Asian uh, prejudice and discrimination uh, amongst our own community. So whether, you know, Filipino versus, you know, Vietnamese versus Cambodian versus Korean, et cetera, et cetera, um, you know, a South Asian, Pakistani, Indian, um, but not to mention how it perpetuates into anti-Blackness. So, you know, Asia is a continent that encompasses about 17 million square miles. So as you can imagine, aside from the rich cultural diversity that exists among Asian Americans, there's various different skin tones, um, ranging from very light hues, to dark brown, not to mention the differences within each country itself. So additionally, post-European colonial countries have a different history and relationship to uh, with colorism than maybe non-European colonized countries, which I think maybe some other panelists can, can share about. I can only speak from a Korean perspective. So I'm not gonna come at it from a place of judgment, but rather just from a place of historical context. So colorism has always existed within Korean society for hundreds, if not thousands of years. Um, historically, the desire for whiteness has never been about um, the desire to be Caucasian because for thousands of years, no one had ever seen a Caucasian, um, but rather it was about class. And in Korean society, skin tone reflects one's position or socioeconomic status. So in the context, whiteness refers not only to the possession of white skin, but also as the social construct and it ratifies the social hierarchy in which you represent. And I actually have some um, slides that I wanted to share that I had made up just to sort of show an example of what we mean by this. So these are Koreans. Um, th these are, this was taken like uh, a long time ago, but this kind of gives you an idea of what the social strata look like. So the darker you were was your social status. And here you have, uh, obviously we don't have pictures of people long time ago, but this gives you an idea of, um, from uh, famous pieces of art, what the aspirational um, um, uh, visual aesthetic was for people. Um, so you can see this was a queen, these were, um, you know, regular people sort of celebrating. Um, and so this gives you, you know, just an idea from a historical standpoint of, you know, Korean society. Did I stop sharing? Yes, you did great. <laughs> okay, okay, good. Um, now, what most people don't realize is that Korea was actually a caste system up until 1894. Um, there was a peasant revolt and then um, uh, the caste system was finally eliminated uh, through the Cabo reform in 1894. So even Korean language itself is built, has hierarchy built into it. And so although the caste system was formally abolished in 1894, like any other type of social reform, you have what is law and then you have what is practiced. So some would argue it wasn't until the Korean War in 1950 that 
the caste system was actually eliminated. So the notion of class permeates very deeply within Korean society. So I explain all of that just to provide historical background and context. So colorism in the modern context really refers to upward mobility. And I really feel, so now that I gave you this historical context, I can really talk about, you know, how it has affected me. And I believe that the brunt and burden of colorism has completely fallen on the backs of women. Women have had to aspire to this ideal. Um, and I'll give you an example of this, is not only upward mobility in staying light, but so that you could marry well. And that's what I was told growing up, is do not go out in the sun, do not be dark, because who wants a dark girl? Who would want to marry that? Who wants to marry a someone that looks like a farmer's wife? And so I gave you those, those pictures just so you could see that was what was embedded in me since practically birth um, and being out in the sun and being American um, and being a kid, we all go out in the sun. We even go so far as laying out in the sun and not really thinking much about it. Um, and that was, you know, growing up, just something that you just did not do. And we see this, um, um, you know, speaking about the brunt of colorism with women, and our first speaker really alluded to this, is, you know, the, the multi-billion dollar industry of skin products. Um, and you can see this is the way skin products are advertised in Korea and to a Korean marketplace. So you can see where they show different shades. So these are all different products um, showing you how you can go from one shade to another shade. So this is this constant media pressure of standard of beauty and conforming to that standard of beauty. And, you know, I am not immune to that as well. And I admit that again, you know, going back into the psyche and having the brunt fall on us as women um, to adhere to all of this. Um, another sort of example I can share with you and is like awful as this sounds. Um, and, and when I was asked to to be part of this panel and thinking about my own experience. Um, the thing that in my life that stands out to me as being the most extreme form of colorism is when I gave birth to my son. Um, when I gave birth to my son, the first thing that came out of my family's mouth was, oh my gosh, he's so dark. And then a subsequent debate amongst my side of the family and my in-laws as to where this darkness could have come from. Whose gene pool had created this darkness? And the fact that it was an internal debate at a time of or that I was celebrating. Uh, I had a C-section. It was really catastrophic. It was traumatic in that. And, and feeling, and again, this is where the brunt comes in with women, feeling somehow that I had failed, that I had failed as a woman and as a mother by giving birth to a dark-skinned child who, by the way, in the scheme of things, isn't even that dark. But the fact that it had come out in the delivery room, that's, you know, that's to the extreme that we're talking about here when it comes to, to colorism. Again, I can only speak uh, for 
you know, within the context of, of my culture. So when you have that, it takes a toll on you. It takes a, it takes a toll on people in general, and especially women to adhere to this high standard. So then we take it to the next step of how that impacts our relationship with those outside of our own community within the greater Pan-Asian community and the pecking order. And I recall, um, um, and, and I, I think she's a great comedian, but you know, an Ali Wong, um, uh, you know, comedy show on Netflix, and, and it really talked about, you know, and everyone, you know, in an all Asian audience knew exactly what she's talking about when she's talking about the jungle Asians. And, you know, while there's, it, it was in a, in the context of uh, comedy, and I think the, the comedy of it is that everyone understood what was meant by that, um, you know, the, the whole Asian American audience. And I really feel that this colorism within the Asian American community itself has really helped damage the many of our relationships because there's a lack of empathy and a lack of seeing um, people as others. So we have East Asians not understanding maybe the plight of other types of Asians when it comes to issues around affirmative action and equity. Um, because again, going back to the, the social hierarchy and classism that exists and one being better than the other. So these are things that, you know, we really have to look at if we're going to have a solid Asian American voice that works towards social justice for all. And then when it comes to anti-Blackness in particular, so when we're dealing with this amongst ourselves, it, it's almost like we don't have even enough capacity to love other people outside of, of um, you know, ourselves. And so we have to work on that. We have to work, um, you know, it's, it's a generational, um, you know, it, it's a generational issue that we have to chip away at each generation at a time. Um, I'm not going to change my parents' perspectives on, you know, they're, they're 80 years old. So I'm not, I, it's because for them, color is linked with class. It is linked with social mobility and nothing I can say can change that. But what I can do is change my son's attitude on that. And by the way, he hears that all the time when he sees my parents or when he sees his other parent, grandparents about being dark. Um, and maybe if you exfoliate your skin a little more, you'll be a little less dark. <laughs> And so it's hearing that over and over again. Um, and, you know, what we can do is one generation at a time make these incremental changes. But we have to, um, you know, look at ourselves. And I think, you know, and I'm speaking to the women here, especially, is we are the mothers. We are the future mothers. We have the opportunity to make change. Um, and we do that within ourselves and we have to reevaluate our standard of beauty. I've had to work on that for a long time. Don't think I haven't gotten laser whitening and lightning, whitening creams. And, you know, I have a whole cabinet full of that, but you have to really reflect and, and think, um, you know, when I'm aspiring for complete porcelain skin, what does that mean for Melania or Nikki and our, our other guests? So we have to really think about that. We have to think about just the damage that we're doing um, within ourselves, within the greater Pan-Asian community. So I'll just leave it at that. Um, and again, thank you very much for this opportunity.
Thank you so much, Tammy, for sharing your story about your son and the history and contemporary examples um, in Korean society of valuing whiteness. Um, I'd like to welcome Julie and Kiana next. All right, hi everyone. Um, before I start, I want to thank the organizers of this listening series for carving out this space for us to share, listen, learn, and be willing to be uncomfortable, to walk with each other. This is what radical love looks like to me. Um, I also want to pause to acknowledge that Orange County, as we have come to know it, sits on the land of the Tongva and Hashiman people. I say this to honor the historic and enduring relationship of indigenous peoples with this land, disrupt historical processes of erasure, and enhance public consciousness of indigenous histories and sovereignty. And lastly, I also lift up the staff at the California Healthy Nail Salon Collaborative. It is their labor and love for our community and commitment to having these very hard conversations each and every day with our nail salon members that inspires me forward. Thank you to Lisa, Yung, Vo, Ju, Tony, Caroline, Maggie, and Mike, who are doing this critical work. Dear my beloved Vietnamese and API community, my sister and I often reminisce about growing up in mom's nail salon. Our jobs were to fill bottles and pedicure tubs, organize magazines and nail polish, greet clients with a smile. Mom worked long hours, so we spent a lot of time there. In my humble opinion, the industry rests on the labor and business know-how of Vietnamese women. In that shop, our moms looked out for each other listened, counseled, and problem solved. They raised kids, managed husbands and partners, and offered support. Because of them, I see my community as strong and as resilient. But in the same way that our love compels us to see the greatest strength in one another, it also calls for us to address the harm we may be willi willingly or unwillingly caused to each other and those around us. The nail salon industry is but one aspect of a larger beast, which worships a very specific standard of beauty that white is normal, light is beautiful. Anti-blackness and specifically colorism is a very real and visceral device that has been passed down from generations and reminds us every day of what is worthy of attention, love and admiration. Light pale skin is so beautiful, they say. Don't go out in the sun, they say. Cover up when you're outside, they say. Why are you so dark, they fret. Use the skin lightening cream, they offer. I think about our history as colonized people in our own homeland, our dark bodies forced to labor, a telltale sign of one's class and lack of education. As our homelands were plundered for their natural resources, our bodies were used to build and excavate our own land for their use. They determined who was civilized, who was good, who was beautiful. Colorism and anti-blackness lies in the ways we position our success, how we often measure our greatness by our proximity and affirmation by whiteness. In 2018, a dispute between workers and clients at Happy Red Apple Nails in Brooklyn turned violent. A video of the brawl showing a salon worker hitting customers with broomsticks quickly reached 750,000 views. Demonstrators forced the salon to shutter its storefront. From a New York Times story, Stacey Ann Thomas, who is Black, said a reckoning was past due. She said, they just see dollar when they see you of the Asian owned businesses in the neighborhood. They don't see a person, they don't see you or me, they just see the money. So now can we also talk about how many nail salons are situated in predominantly black and brown communities? In private, we judge and condemn, while at the same time profit from these same communities. We dehumanize. Perhaps some of us here today have been offered the privilege of education in large part because of the sacrifices of our own parents working long hours in a nail salon embedded in black and brown communities. Our very existence in this space is tied to the labor and economic resources of black people. There are so many layers and cross points in our collective stories. Unlearning and undoing starts with me, starts with us. If it doesn't start with our hearts and minds, then how can we speak truth from our lips? We must not only raise our fists on the streets, but call ourselves into view. As an Asian person who is light skinned, how do I show up, be present, but also uplift and make space for those in my own community who have been unseen, unheard and disregarded? What voice do our mixed race, black and Asian siblings have in our community spaces? I believe our role is to make visible what has been unseen or not seen. So today, I want to share my time with my friend, Kiana Kinsey, who I had the pleasure to work with when she was a student at Environmental Charter High School. Kiana just finished her first year at Smith College in Massachusetts, and I am honored to welcome her. Hello, everyone. I'm so excited to be here. I just want to say thank you for everyone on the panel for welcoming me and everyone who put all this together for making my, um, for helping me share my voice. 
Dear family, friends, and API community, coming from two different worlds, I'm able to recognize what it means to be Black and Japanese in Japan and the US. I was born in Japan in a city called Yokohama, and I'm able to speak Japanese so naturally I thought I was Japanese. However, when I looked down at my skin, I was Black. I was too Black to be Asian and too Asian to be Black. I was never really ashamed of being two races. I embraced it, but I struggled with my identity because I was confused and uneducated on terms such as microaggressions, colorism, and anti-Blackness. I experienced anti-Blackness in my own Asian community. Stereotypes of Black people are often portrayed in media as lazy, uneducated, and dangerous criminals. That's how my grandparents saw my dad, and these stereotypes disowned my mother for marrying a Black man. Jokes were being made of washing my brown skin to make it white or clean again when I was younger by my Japanese grandfather, which a few days ago I found out from having a conversation with my sister. This shows Eurocentric beauty standards are rooted in cultures. With that said, some would strive to have white mixed children in Japan and other cultures because of Eurocentric beauty standards and being white was deemed more beautiful, better chance of opportunity and becoming successful. There are different privileges of being white and Asian and being black and Asian. My Japanese identity was just an excuse to ex escape the image of being black. However, I realized how ignorant I was and I was able to appreciate it. So I joined social media in high school where I was able to see videos and ads of people who look like me, which was my main source of encouragement and taught me I was beautiful no matter what I looked like. And in high school, we had a senior thesis assignment, and I decided to pick my senior thesis topic of racial microaggressions directed towards multiracial communities in schools to combat and decrease the numbers of microaggressions in school. Um, so I felt empowered to educate my peers and communities about this, this social injustice, and, um, and I'm using my power of my voice to share my story with you. And I'm Japanese and Black, no more or less. Look at me and see my color, I'm here. I think this is time to make a change to educate other, others on microaggressions, colorism, anti-Blackness, and many other important terms. I'm a product of Black and Asian love, so let's come together to create a unity and love for one another. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Julie and Kiana, for sharing space with us and sharing your really intimate stories. Um, that was really powerful and I'm so grateful to have strong leaders leading this work and challenging uh, our, our community's notions of beauty. Because beauty is not what we have been told. Colorism has distorted what our society has valued as beautiful. But consider the diversity of our community and the beauty in each and every one of us. How can one be more beautiful than the other? Uh, Melania shared about being excluded from her own community for being visibly biracial. She also shared really powerfully that we need to urge our community that it is our responsibility to overthrow white supremacy and the patriarchy by saying that these are not our beauty standards of beauty. Nikki explained how the standards of beauty in our own communities don't include brown or darker skinned role models, someone who looked like her. Nikki made a plea that we can't solve uh, resolve gaps if we marginalize dark skin and black folks. Addressing colorism is not a solution to anti-blackness, but it is only a step to inclusion in our community. Tammy shared how she felt that she had failed for giving birth, a, a miraculous um, experience, to a darker skinned son. She linked this to explicit examples of how there's not just a constant media pressure, but also a long history in Korean society of the obsessive value over being fair or light, lighter skin. These are things we have to examine within ourselves in order to move forward. Julie showed how when she grew up, she saw that nail salons worshiped a specific standard of beauty, that white is beautiful. They determined who was civilized, good. Anti-blackness is how we measured our success by proximity to whiteness. But what voice do our mixed race black and Asian siblings have? Kiana, a young leader who I'm so excited is already in this work, um, expressed her struggles in embracing two worlds because of the structures like media and education valuing whiteness. She said, look at me and see my color. I am here. Um, I have one question for you all, um, and you can answer in any order, but 
What do you hope our community can do to challenge these ingrained notions valuing whiter skin? What is something that they can do every day? I think education is such a powerful tool and amidst everything happening in the world right now, you know, we're all connected through technology and social media. Um, and so we have portals to education right in our hands, right in our bedrooms, in our homes. Um, and so educate yourselves, you know, look up Audrey Lord, Angela Davis, understand um, weapons of oppression that have been used um, so many years. And knowledge is power. I also think we need to have conversations that are uncomfortable. We need to um, hold folks accountable. We need to um, address things when we hear them, whether it's from friends or from family members and community members, and really um, let folks know that we can't continue on the way we have, that the path needs to change. Uh, we need to move to a place of true equity um, and move beyond just diversity and, and understand that true inclusion is not just having one brown person in the room or kind of overlooking racism. We need to be anti-racist. We need to be anti-colorist um, and truly embrace each other. And so I think we can get there through education and really doing the work to um, make the changes within our community. Thank you, Melania. It really is uncomfortable conversations that allow us to grow and push us forward. Um, you're right. We have to move to equity and we have to move beyond diversity. We can't just have one Black person and saying that we've done our job. We need to continue to grow and do better for our community. Does anyone else want to answer? I can answer. Um, I think I agree with everything um, that you've said. Um, and I also want to push us to think about what it means to do anti-racism work, to, to abolish colorism within our particular fields of influence, right? Like I am a college student, so I talk to college students. I am going into the field of education and learning about what does colorism look like in the classroom? What does anti-blackness look like in the classroom? Um, and for those of us who are in other fields, right? Like what does medical racism look like? What does it mean to be studying disease while only looking at light skin and therefore ignoring what disease looks like on non-white bodies? Um, and that extends to everything, right? When you're going into local politics, what, like how do you reach out to marginalized communities when you're going into I don't know, literally every field, there's a way for us to combat both colorism and through that anti-blackness um, in ways that we can make tangible change in. Because it's not realistic for us to try to change fields that we know nothing about. We can't influence every level of society as individual people. Um, and so it takes doing that work in every single space that possibly exists um, for us to actually achieve a sustainable change. Thanks so much, Nikki. Um, I really enjoyed hearing that like, we can make t tangible change in every field and we can change the spaces that we know and that's where it starts. It starts with each of us and each of you who are here. And um, I just wanna add just to that is, you know, we all perpetuate anti-Black racism in our daily lives, whether it's through colorism, and how we look and, and we can't fight anti-black racism until we notice how it manifests in ourselves and how it manifests in others um, on a daily basis in our workplace online engagement social interactions and so i just want to put that out there so i want to challenge the audience to really Look at yourself. 
and I'll do the same for myself. <laughs> Thanks so much, Tammy, for reminding each other that we have to hold each other accountable and we ourselves need to change as well. Um, Julie and Kiana? Yes, um, I agree with ev what everyone said on this panel. Like I, I, I echo that. Um, and I think like I'm a college student as well. So I think it's really great to talk to other students about this and having really important conversations in the classroom, maybe outside of classroom, you know, with your friends and things like that, because it happens, you know, once you tell someone, they're gonna, they might tell someone else. So, you know, it's, you're just gonna have to keep on going. And, you know, I know it's gonna take time, you know, but I feel like with through other different platforms, we're able to, you know, have a start and like, show everyone, you know, this is what we have. And, you know, we're trying to get through this together. Yeah. I mean, I guess the only thing, you know, I just echo what everyone has shared. The only thing I would add is like, just be kind to yourself and know that it's going to take time and, you know, it's, it's baby steps, right? And I just want to share, I had a conversation with the staff at the collaborative and Yom and Bo were sharing with me that, you know, part of their leadership development um, program a few years ago is they had a module around um, the history of Asians in America, including other people of color. And so they had um, conversations with our nail salon members about um, not just, you know, MLK, but sort of like the history behind it, right? And a lot of these members were so surprised to learn this history. And they said, you know, how come my kids didn't learn that in school? They didn't tell that to me, right? And I think it's just to remind ourselves that like our, our elders, you know, our first generation elders here in this country, they were not exposed to that history and that education. I mean, heck, a lot of us, right? It took a lot of time. It took a lot of us till college to learn that, that history, the real history, right? And so I think, and then what happened, and they shared with me that, so that was something that happened a number of years ago. And then when the uprising started a few months ago, um, some of those members actually contacted them and said, hey, can you send me that PowerPoint that we went over? Um, I wanna share with my friends. Right. And these are women who work in the nail salon industry are not, you know, at, at the academic level having these types of conversations. So that was so inspiring to me because it reminded me like it is possible. It is possible for our community to make these connections and to be transformed. But we have to be patient with ourselves and with each other. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kiana and Julie, um, for reminding us that this is hard work, but we're doing it together um, and to be kind to ourselves and that the work is intergenerational. Our grandparents were exposed to this, but it's also our responsibility to call them in and to do the learning alongside them. Um, so with that, I'd like to thank all of our panelists for such a beautiful discussion um, and to thank all of our participants for joining us in our series of conversations in our summer of listening um, today. We'll continue these conversations every day, at, every Friday at noon, um, and our next session will be Friday, August 7th from uh, 12 p.m. to 1 p.m. Um, that will also be a super cool uh, conversation. We'll be talking about anti-Blackness and the AAPI ethnic media. Um, our question is, how can we amplify stories of our intersectional struggles? Um, we'll have another incredible table of speakers, and the series will be recorded and available to watch on Facebook. Um, if you're interested in joining us in deeper conversation, please direct message Okapika on Facebook. Um, and be an act of change. Fill out your census. Urge others around you to fill out your census. Um, it'll affect you, your communities, and all of us for the next 10 years. Um, on the behalf of the planning committee, I'd like to thank you all so much for attending and have a wonderful, sunny, and healthy day. <laughs>